everybody to San Diego State University webinar titled Unfinish Indonesia, Islam and Democracy, Film Screening and Discussion with Professor Robert Hefner and Professor Zainal Abidin Bagir. We are happy to have a truly global webinar that about 350 people register all around the world. We also have Professor Hefner joining us from Boston and Professor Bagir joining us from Indonesia. This is Ahmed Kuru, Portis Professor of Political Science. And this event is made possible by the Portis Endowment and its generous funding. It is also an event co-sponsored by the Center for Islamic and Arabic Studies. And I am a member and the new director, unfortunately, because our previous director passed away about a month ago, Professor Khalil uh, Muhammad. We are very sorry about his passing. And there will be an event to remember him in memoriam celebrating the life of Dr. Khalil Muhammad. Exactly a week from today, 7 p.m. San Diego time. And my assistant, Farah Adit, who is helping this event possible, I am thankful to him too, is going to put in chat the link for this Dr. Khalil Muhammad memoriam event you can register and join us a week from today. Forte's lecture series include webinars last year for, uh, by a book talk by Darana Cemoğlu and another, another talk by Francis Fukuyama. Both of them are in San Diego State University Political Science YouTube channel. This event, the discussion part, will also be in the channel but not the film part. The film is not available publicly English in YouTube, on YouTube yet. So therefore, it's a privilege for our audience to see it today. And we are also privileged and honored to have the two co-producers of six films, six films documentaries on Indonesia. And today we are just showing one of them. So we have Professor Robert Hefner and Professor Zainal Abidin Bagir, the two co producers. Professor Hefner will have an introductory discussion. I will start with some uh, preliminary questions. Meanwhile, the audience will be able to type questions with Q&A. And then after the film series, we'll have another discussion with Professor Bagir Again, the audience will be able to type questions in Q&A. So starting now, feel free to write your questions. I'll try to do my best to read them to the two speakers. And let me tell you that in addition to this event, this semester, Porter's lecture series, we'll have another event on March 8th. It is a book talk by Georgetown University's Sean Roberts his recent book, The War on the Uyghurs, China's Internal Campaign Against a Muslim Minority. We will also put the registration link of that event into the chat so you can register. And all of our events are also in the Center for Islamic and Arabic Studies website, cias.sdsu.edu as well as Porteous event list online. So let me briefly read you the bios of the two eminent scholars we have, and we are honored having them today. Robert Hefner is professor of anthropology and former director of the Institute on Culture, Religion, and World Affairs at Boston University. He is the former president of the Association for Asian Studies. 
Dr. Hafner has directed 19 research projects and organized 18 international conferences and author or edited 19 books, including seminar, Civil Islam. Among the most recent books include Sharia Politics, Islamic Law and Society in Modern World, and Muslims and Modernity, Culture and Society since 1800. Professor Hafner is an expert on Islam and politics and social interaction in Indonesia. So is Zainal Abidin Bagir, who is joining us from Indonesia. Zainal Abidin Bagir is the director of the Center for Religious and Cultural Cross-Cultural Studies at University Gajah Yogyakarta, Indonesia. He is the editor of a number of books, including Aspirations for Modernity and Prosperity. Professor Bagir specializes in philosophy of religion, religion and science, and religion and ecology. He is the author of Science and Religion in the Post-Colonial World, Interfaith Perspectives. Bagir was also a part of Christianity and Freedom Project headed by the Berkeley Center Religious Freedom Project. So we are going to start with Professor Hafner, then the film screening, then we'll have another discussion with Professor Zainal Abidin Bagir. Now, as the moderator, I have the prerogatives to ask questions to Professor Hafner. And if Professor Hafner could open his camera so we can have a conversation. This event is scientific, this event is socially important, but also it's important for me because I see Professor Hafner is one of my tutors, one of my role models. I truly appreciate his scholarship, his personality, and it's truly an honor for SDSU having him with us today. So I would like to start with very basic questions, if you allow me. First of all, why Indonesia? Could you please explain to our audience the importance of Indonesia as a Muslim majority country, as a democracy? Then why is a documentary film series that you have produced six films? As an academic, why do you think it's important to reach out with this media? And last portion of my introductory question is that so far, how is the reaction? Because as well as I understand, it, there is too much emphasis on the Middle East when we people discuss Islam here in the United States, even in other parts of the world. Did your film series help or is it going to help a global understanding of Indonesia? These are my initial questions. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Can you hear me okay? Let me. Yes, perfect. First of all, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to, to uh, join with you this evening. And I'll say to everybody who is watching this evening, it's a special honor for me because even though Ahmed uh, referred to me as a mentor, he is someone from whom I have learned and who, in a series of books, has, I think, transformed the understanding that many of us have of religion and politics in the modern age and Islam in democracy in particular. So I, my, my debt of gratitude, it really extends to him and to his scholarship, which is truly exemplary. Now I'll try to, having made those introductory remarks, I also want to just send a shout out to uh, Zainal Abidin Bagir, my uh, executive, co-executive producer, who is himself, and I'll be very brief here, one sentence, he is representative of the new public intellectuals that have emerged in Indonesia and for which Indonesia is so deservedly famous. One of the keys to the process that I'll be talking about just briefly here and that the film focuses on, one of the keys to the process of the successful transform transition, if contended, but the successful transition to democracy in Indonesia after 1998-99, a success that stands in stark contrast to, unfortunately, that which we have seen in most of the Arab world after the Arab uprisings, 
One of the keys has been the emergence of a new generation of Muslim intellectuals who have sustained a commitment to religious piety, but at the same time sought to integrate new ways of understanding the world, including the social sciences and questions of democracy and social justice into their approach. I know a few people in Indonesia who exemplify that better than my partner in this, in this six documentary series, Pazainal Abidin Bakir. Now, why Indonesia? On to Ahmed, on to your questions. Why Indonesia? Well, the background is I've hinted at already. Indonesia is, yes, the largest Muslim majority country in the world. Uh, it's also the third largest democracy in the world. But it is at the same time a country that many people, including many scholars of Islam, as well as, if I may put it this way, ordinary Muslims in the Middle East and North Africa, they sort of wonder, is it truly representative of Islam if in any way? It's Southeast Asian. The majority of people are not primary Arabic speakers, which, of course, is true of 80 percent of the Muslims in the world. They live they are not Arabic speakers as a first language. But in any case, there's all these complicating factors that raise questions about Indonesia. But I think the answer to the question of why Indonesia is that, first of all, Indonesia is an exceptionally Islamic place. Its population is 87%, 87% Muslim. And it is at the same time a country that even though perhaps 100 years ago, it was, you know, it was characterized by the kind of mixing of local and global, in particularly more normative-minded Islamic traditions that we see all across the Muslim world Indone at that time. Indonesia, since the 1970s and 1980s, has experienced a remarkable religious resurgence, so that it today, by most political science surveys, it figures as one of the most religiously, Islamically observant countries in the world, rather remarkably. But at the same time, now why Indonesia? At the same time, it did negotiate after 32 years of authoritarian rule, authoritarian developmentalist rule uh, under a largely secular nationalist kind of military guy, President Suharto. It made in 1988, 1998, 1999, uh, at the first very, very uncertain tentative transition to democracy which was subsequently consolidated so that institutionally at least, and I'm emphasizing that, Indonesia today is a country in which free and fair elections take place, in which the press is uh, remarkably free to speak, and most, most significant yet, in which the great majority of people, including Muslims, the 87% of the population who is Muslim, say that things like freedom of press, freedom of association, these are critical for a modern society, for a Muslim society and a democratic Indonesia. So Indonesia is interesting as on that. Why, not so much why Indonesia, why focus on it, but why did Indonesia, as the largest Muslim majority country in the world, succeed in this transition? Now, secondly, now I'll be briefer here. At the same time, questions have been raised as in much of the world, including our own, my own, United States of America, we have seen in Indonesia since 2005, but particularly since the 2010s, the rise of certain majoritarian tendencies, certain kind of, it's not anything specific to Islam, it's something very similar to the rise of Christian nationalism in the United States. We've seen currents in Indonesia that have challenged this more inclusive and democratic understanding. And that's too part of the reason not to sort of celebrate in an uncritical way, but that's one of the things that we wanted to bring to the fore with the films. The fact that this is a country of contentions. It's a country of great achievements and remarkable, remarkable cultural and intellectual vibrance, truly remarkable. But at the same time, it's a country that has many of the same challenges, problems that we see in other Muslim majority countries. But I would say that we also see in equally dramatic outline in the United States of America and Western Europe. So that was the rationale um, for these films. Second, on your second question, I'll be briefer. Why would an academic do this? I came into academia from a slightly different background. I was an ordinary kid growing up in Ohio. I had been involved in my youth in the civil rights movement. 
I had been involved in my youth in the movement against Vietnam. So, and though, you know, my own politics has become a little bit more complicated and nuanced since my activist days, uh, I felt at the same time, I've always felt that we academics have a public culture, public knowledge responsibility. And I might add my colleague here, Ahmed Kuru, to me again, serves as just a shining example of this, somebody who can speak in two registers, linguistic registers. So that's, that's what the films are about. I'll, I'll end that there. But we wanted to, we feel a responsibility as scholars and academics to not just speak to fellow scholars and academics. The world has far too many urgent issues and problems. Third and last, the question that uh, that Ahmed raised. I'm going to close Outlook. I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't have it closed. You heard it in the background. Uh, how has the reaction been? Well, this was a film. Another ambition of this film was that it's. Uh, I don't want to be trendy here, it, but it was, if you will, a kind of post-colonial enterprise, which involved not just full collaboration, but recognition of the importance of Indonesian scholars, but like Pat Zainal, Zainal Abidin Bagir and his remarkable set of colleagues. But in addition to working with those skilled academic scholars and public intellectuals, we wanted to, we wanted these films to reach audiences both in Indonesia, and in fact, in some ways, first and foremost, in an Indonesia of contention, as I said, and I would say, and Pat Zaino can address this better, I would say the reception in Indonesia has been remarkable. Uh, the full range of films has had many hundreds of showings, primarily in non-governmental settings and non-commercial settings, though some commercial as well, but in Islamic boarding schools, in madrasas, in Catholic schools. So the, we, we, and these were all, all these film showings were initiated by the people uh, who actually ended as hosts, we didn't initiate them. So I think in Indonesia, we have become part of the public conversation about unfinished Indonesia, if I can refer to the title of this film. Here in the United States, the English language versions of these films have only become available, actually the first two only in the last four months. So we're still in a launching phase. Uh, thus far, uh, we've had our greatest impact, not surprisingly, in those universities that have programs either in Islamic studies or Muslim politics and or in Southeast Asian studies. And I would say there too, I've been very, very gratified, but we're still, uh, we're still building that momentum. So I was muted. I have one question coming from Farah Adid, and it's about the role of Nahdada Ulama and Muhammadiyya. In your seminal book, Civil Islam and other writings, you analyze these groups. And the question asking you, uh, if possible, compare with the AKP in Turkey or Ikhwan and Muslimin Muslim Brothers in Egypt or other Islamist groups all around the world. What makes Nahdada Ulema and Muhammadiyya different in a way that they really contribute to democratization? Is it ideological, structural? How would you summarize the difference? One of the remarks, it's a great question. Thank you, Farah. It's a great question. And it's one that I have thought about my whole life because I've traveled, as Ahmed knows, I've traveled to Indonesia, I've traveled to North Africa, Egypt. I love the Muslim Middle East. But there are certain striking features about Indonesia. One is the fact that nationalism, a peculiar kind of nationalism, a multi-ethnic, multi-religious nationalism, it was challenged at times, but it was embraced by the great majority of Muslim Indonesians. And it was embraced by the great majority of Indonesians, first and foremost, because of the remarkable efforts of the Muhammadiyya, which was established in 1912, and contributed to the independence movement, and Mahdatu Ulama, which is a much larger organization. Muhammadiyya today has about 25 to 30 million or members. Mahdatu Ulama is a less formally organized kind of coalition, but it has in the neighborhood of 70 to 90 million followers. So these are the largest traditionalist and reformist, modernist 
Muslim organizations in the world. They were there, back to the Ikhwan comparison, they were there in place from the 1910s and 1920s, providing educational services, providing hospital services. Why is that significant? Not just because they were doing social welfare, but because through the course of these practical activities, they came to think very early on in a practical way about what? The higher aims of Islam, the maqasid al-sharia, the, what is Islam? What really are the values of Islam that are most relevant for the modern world and that need to be kind of applied to make Islam as it is? Such a vital ethical, as well as organizational contributor to the well-being of, and the rahmat of the whole world. The, so that in some ways it wasn't driven by theory or kind of coffee house Muslim intellectuals. But in practice, these two huge Muslim welfare organizations for now more than a hundred years, they have been walking the walk of rethinking and kind of not rethinking Islam. Islam is Islam. They're rethinking how do we take Islamics, Islam's great values and apply them and draw on new sources of knowledge, new sources of understanding the world, including the social sciences political theory and draw them into a, a, a kind of re, a, a, a much deeper kind of reconceptualization of Muslim public ethics. That's what they've done. And that's why I'll end here. That's why surprisingly effortlessly and without the great controversy that you've seen in so many other Muslim, not all, but so many other Muslim lands, ideas of democracy, human rights, qualified in some instances and adjusted on some terms, have been uh, you know, adjust, uh, adopted by the great majority and subscribed to by the great majority of Muslim Indonesians. So these two institutions were absolutely critical contributors to Indonesia's remarkable political modernity. So another question is about So I'm trying to come up and bringing together and it's ask. So one thing when I watch all six films, one of my colleagues said from Turkey, Turkish background, that it's very interesting that an Islamic leader in Indonesia in your documentary is playing soccer with kids on the streets even taking shower under the rain, so natural. What I understand in the Middle East that religious leaders are very formal and they put a high status, a charismatic attitude. You can see them sleeping, you can see them singing, let alone playing soccer or taking shower under the rain on the street. So is this climate, is this the eclectic nature of Islam? I know that it is, it's a more anthropological deep question and I'm making many generalizations, but I'm sure that many uh, uh, audience watching the documentary feel that way, that, oh, that, that's very natural, uh, a very different style. C can we talk about this a little bit speculating? <laughs> Well, that particular gentleman is, is from Nadatu Ulama background, and he's not only from Nadatu Ulama, but he's a new generation Ustad, a new generation uh, preacher who has adopted, yes, he's, he's realized society has changed. Young people have changed. Everybody's online. They're watching things that, you know, maybe they shouldn't be watching. And in fact, I am sure that he and many other people feel that way. But he feels at the same time that some of the formality and reserve that also, I, might, I would add, Ahmed, characterized uh, traditional relations among Muslim teachers and students, and still does to a significant degree in Indonesia, that some of that in certain circumstances has to be put aside. He is somebody who's very comfortable doing that. Now, not everybody would do that. He's, he's, he, but he's oriented himself to a young population whom he feels are, if you will, constantly drawn into other kind of entertainments. And he wants to show them and reassure them, no, this is a, 
Muslim ethics and values and being a good Muslim takes many, many different forms. So he's in the, and so that even though his, even I was surprised by his taking the shower in the rain, but uh, actually there's a number, well, Indonesia has a number of these particularly traditionalist sort of Sufi people who think, no, we really have to, we have to relax and bring others in because the message of Islam, the message of God's grace is so important. It, we have to reach out and put ourselves in the situation of the new generation. Thank you. So I'm going over questions. One question is very specific about the recent Congress of Nahdat al-Ulama. It says, Professor Hefner, how do you see the new chairman of NU and the leadership of Pak Yahya in terms of promoting democratic and good governance in the country? How do you see a new facing the rays of Islamism in Nahdatul Ulama and how to challenge the rising Islamists? Well, Yahya, the new, the new chair of Nahdatul Ulama is a man whom I interviewed in 2000, so more than 20 years ago, when he was a young man, and I guess I was certainly younger. <laughs> so, but I, <laughs> and I remember from the interview, that even then, first of all, he was a great supporter of Abdurrahman Wahid, the late great, wasn't a great executive, his administrative skills were not as great as his ideals, but he was a great person and a great Muslim and a great believer in interfaith collaboration and a multi-religious and multi-ethnic Indonesian. So he was, he was a beloved man. So Pa Yahya or Yahya, uh, who's the new chair, of uh, Nadat Ulama is to degree that even some to some degrees takes my breath away. He's very much in that tradition. And this is not just a matter of style and if you will, outreach. It's a matter, this is a, a, a fellow who studied sociology at the, in the Department of Sociology at Gajamada University, which is one of the two best universities in uh, Indonesia. And I, I've taught actually in sociology 20 years ago, it's just a remarkable place. He came into the department a few years after I was there. So he's somebody who is both a deep Sufi, deeply religious Muslim in a very, very everyday quotidian sense. Yet he's at the same time, somebody who can talk comfortably about the challenge of diversity in our world. He can talk comfortably about the rise of Christian nationalism in Western Europe, in the United States, to a degree that I, I just leaves me breathtaking. So in short, to answer the question, I think, uh, I think he's a remarkable man and brings kind of remarkable skill and expertise. He's also a very good, unlike his mentor, Abdurrahman Wahid, who had his limits, and I knew him well, and loved Abdurrahman Wahid. I loved Abdurrahman Wahid. But uh, uh, Pa Yahya has uh, administrative skill, just expertise. Now I do have one comment of, uh, not, uh, of concern, which is that when you have someone like Yahya Khalil, who is a Stakov, Yahya, Yahya Khalil Stakov, the new head of Ennu, uh, I think he's remarkably good, gifted and, and a good orator, but there is inevitably uh, a possibility that he as a leader can get ahead of even his own mass organization. I think he understands this. I know he understands this, but he also feels, especially in the, after the rise and after 2015, the rise of ISIS, he was there and he saw the challenge of Islamism in, in its radical extremists. Not its, Islamism comes in many varieties, some democratic, and we have to emphasize that. But ISIS, in some of the extremist groups, the Al Qaeda link groups in Indonesia, these are these are something else entirely. And he has made this his special mission to sort of push back and assert the legitimacy, the blessing of his, the legitimacy of Islam as professed in Islam, and the fact that Islam is a blessing to the entire world. And he's done so in a very forceful way. I will see what happens. So there are many questions coming, and I wish I could spend hours with you, maybe days, of course, but we have five minutes 
And let me just ask the final question, which is about the polarization between secularists and Islamists. That's the key thing in Pakistan, Turkey, Egypt. Do you see such a polarization, which is a, is it a crucial factor explaining Indonesian politics? Or are, is it a different uh, dimension, different parameter that we don't, we don't, we should not use the Middle Eastern understanding of secularist versus Islamist polarization in politics? Well, how do you see Indonesia in these terms? I do see it as different. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, we can, as political scientists, and you wrote just in 2000, you published in 2009, a remarkable book and another one of those great books that I incidentally am using this very semester <laughs> in my course on religion and politics. So you know that secularism is defined in very, very different ways, and it's implemented and practiced in very different ways. And our dear friend Al Stepan, the late Al Stepan, made that same point in a number of, of articles, but you've made it, I think, in an even more sustained way. Um, so, but the situation in Indonesia is distinctive, which is that the great majority of, uh, of Muslim Democrats, first of all, the great majority of Indonesian Muslims are Muslim Democrats, and the great majority of Muslim Democrats do not believe that you need a secularism, a secular policy in the sense of a privatization of religion. They, in fact, enthusiastically support, and most of the Indonesian public, including the 10% of the public who is Christian, and then the one in 2% who are a Buddhist or Hindu, the great majority of the Indonesian public is, is agreed on this, that if we talk about a separation of religious and state authority, we're not talking about the privatization of religion. State support for religious education, state support for hospitals, for all manner of religious institutions in a way that of course your book uh, in other countries, Ahmed outlines very clearly, that issue is, is not just not a issue of contention. So the real, issue in Indonesia, and I'll end here, isn't between secularism and Islamism. It's between uh, people who are committed to the ideal of a multi-religious religion, a multi-religious Indonesia in which Indonesia in Indonesia Islam is given pride of place and the state provides support for Islamic schools. But between that vision of a less of a non-differentiated citizenship, a citizenship that is inclusive, even though while recognizing 87% of the population is Muslim, inevitably some greater state funding and all for, is gonna to go to Islamic schools and all. The major contest is between those multi-confessional inclusive Muslims and on one hand, and those who want a, diff, a citizenship that is differentiated first and foremost in terms of Muslim and non-Muslim. And though there, that contention continues thus far, the voting that we've seen every five years from 1999 to today shows that the majority of Muslims in Indonesia subscribe to the former view, an inclusive multi-religious Indonesia. That doesn't mean we don't get problems and that's what this film today is about. That's an excellent connection to the film. Professor Hefner, Thank you very much for your insightful answers. In just less than half an hour, you explained so much. And there are still questions coming and I encourage them to read your books, your articles and the documentaries to learn more about. And hopefully we'll invite you again in person in the future, let's say inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. an honor having you. And, and thank you so much for your answers. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Great honor and pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm moving to the movie. fourth most populous country in the world, a nation with the world's largest Muslim population.
the third largest democracy in the world. as defenders of a multi-religious Indonesia and an inclusive Islam. This much is certain. There are many phases of Islam in Indonesia, and the Muslim community as a whole will continue to develop within a context shaped by rival narratives of nationalism and citizenship. Indonesia is unfinished. Indonesia is unfinished, but our program is not finished, is continue. We are thankful to Professor Hefner and Professor Bagir for producing such a lovely, informative and important documentary. And they also co-edited a volume published by Notre Dame University Press with the title Indonesian Pluralities, which is the title of their film series and we only show you out of six, we only show you one of the six movies. Now we are going to have a discussion with the other co-producer, Professor Zainal Abidin Bagir. And if he, is op he can open his video, we'll be able to see him from Indonesia. And by the way, yeah. two explanations to the audience, you can type your questions with Q&A, Please do not raise your hand if you did lower your hand because I can't let you speak. It's only typing question mode. And during the video, for those who saw me at the top corner, I really tried to remove myself, but technically I don't think it was possible or I couldn't. Now, um, Professor Bagir, are you with us? And do you need my help in yes. the video? Yeah, I, I cannot um, show my camera. So I make you co-host. Now it should be fine. Yes. yes. Thank you for being there. That was it's so lovely, beautiful. I think a sunny day in Indonesia. So let me tell the audience that the first time I, uh, you and I had an email exchange, what the time of the passing of Alfred Stepan, an important political scientist. We, I met my postdoc with him at Columbia. We lost him about seven years ago. Then I wrote an obituary and you kindly translate it and get it published in your center in Indonesia and how Indonesia is so attentive uh, to the study of Islam and democracy in the US and globally. It was just one of the reflections of the intellectual dynamism and academic vibrancy in Indonesia. So now we have many questions, but I would like to start with my introductory questions to you, uh, Professor Bagir. Uh, first of all, uh, if we focus on the political dimension of the documentary, there is the issue of blasphemy. 
And for an American audience, they are not much familiar with it. Could you please explain how important it is about democracy, about freedom of speech, and how is the situation in Indonesia? Is it just one event because incident that the Christian ethnically Chinese governor or mayor of the capital city, Jakarta, which may be over 15 million people, was imprisoned over a year and lost the status explained in the documentary, which is really terrible. But at the same time, some of my Indonesian friends are telling me that he is now the CEO of Indonesian Petroleum and Natural Gas Corporation appointed by President Jokowi. So therefore it really reflects a complexity in Indonesia. And can you give help us understand this complexity? Yeah, well, okay. So um, if I, by way of introduction, um, I, I may say that um, the issue of blasphemy, um, I, I may call it as um, a thorn in the flesh of the nation. <clears throat> And we have that um, saying also in, in Indonesia. Um, <clears throat> this is one issue which I think is um, um, has become quite central. Um, but it is, is it is a recent phenomenon actually. <clears throat> um, the blasphemy law has been um, we have had um, blasphemy, blasphemy law since 1965. Um, <clears throat> but um, probably paradoxically. Um, it, has, it has been used um, more frequently um, after the democratizations in 1998. So um, since 1965 to 1998, well, more or less um, 35 years, um, there were only um, around 10 cases um, of um, yeah, blasphemy accusation, um, which was brought to the um, court. But um, in the past 20 years, um, um, after the democratizations, we have had um, probably almost 100 um, cases. So <clears throat> probably this is this is um, puzzling. Um, in a situation where there is democratization, um, um, a law like this, which um, really restricts um, freedom of expression as well as freedom of religion or belief, um, has become um, much more um, popular. And not only that, it's not only um, there are more cases, <clears throat> um, but there has been um, four judicial reviews um, in the Constitutional Court. Um, so four different um, persons or group of persons brought this law to the Constitutional Court. And in all these four um, reviews, uh, the petitions to either um, cancel the law or revise the law or giving um, uh, uh, less restrictive um, interpretations of the law, <clears throat> it has all always um, been rejected by the Constitutional Court. Uh, by the way, Constitutional Court is also <clears throat> uh, the, the product of the democratization. So why is it um, that blasphemy law has become um, um, this um, um, big um, issue? So <clears throat> um, the case of Ahok is actually, I mean, the um, Jakarta governor, it's rather exceptional. Um, it's the first and so far the only case where this law <clears throat> has been used against an active, um, um, against an active um, public um, officers. And at that level, I mean, governor and governor of Jakarta. So it, it's huge. Um, in most cases, um, it was not um, like that. <clears throat> um, it is not only an issue um, about um, punishing one who insult um, Prophet Muhammad or the Quran, uh, but it has been used for uh, many um, purposes. And by the way, um, it has been used not only by Muslims, um, but also by um, people from different religious communities, in, um, by Hindus, um, Christians, um, although um, <clears throat> less cases like that, um, mostly by Muslims, but, but it has become more um, popular. Um, one of the purposes is sometimes it's um, to settle um, personal dispute in some cases. Um, many of the cases are quite trivial. I mean, like um, one person um, kicking um, an offering, um, a Hindu offering in Bali, for example, a Christian, and then um, she was brought to um, the court. So, so many variety of um, cases. So, <clears throat> 
um, in this particular um, issue of um, um, Ahok, um, the, the Jakarta governor, I think we can see how um, blasphemy law has become a threat to democracy. <clears throat> because we can see here, um, um, actually without it, um, Ahok would have won. Um, and more importantly, actually he won the first round of the election. <clears throat> In the second round of the election, when the stake um, had become higher, um, <clears throat> and um, his opponents, and by his opponent, um, I, I didn't imply directly his rival, uh, rival candidate, um, but the people who supported um, the rival candidate, um, <clears throat> they use a stronger tool to discredit um, the, the governor. Um, and blasphemy law um, is an instrument for that a very effective instrument for that. Religion was not always used in elections, um, whether this is national elections or um, uh, local um, elections, um, but um, religious issues um, use um, usually only when there's a need to leverage your position. <clears throat> I mean, when, when it's, it's, um, you, you need something more, um, um, your performance is not enough and you need something more, and then religion um, comes in as a handy um, instrument. Um, so that, that's that's the the um, um, the importance of the blasphemy law. And um, <clears throat> in a sense, um, well, um, in the film, um, actually, you have seen um, the debate, um, the constitutional debate in 1945, um, a debate whether <clears throat> um, there should be a mention of Islamic Sharia in the constitutions that is um, an attempt to give more prominent um, um, place for um, Sharia, and it failed. It was repeated um, twice, um, including in the last um, constitutional amendment in 2000 to 2002. Um, there was, again, another attempt to um, um, put Sharia um, in the constitution. Um, it has always um, failed. Um, so in a sense, um, I would say that the blasphemy law um, takes that place. Um, why? Because um, in this law, um, there is um, 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 th this. Uh, th there is um, a clause um, which, um, in a sense, um, gives a place for religious authority. Um, so actually, um, the party which should determine whether an act um, constitutes a blasphemy or not is the government, the state, um, but the state can consult religious leaders. So this is, um, this is a way how religious authority um, makes its way to um, decisions um, made by the state. So blasphemy law, again, is not only an insult, an issue about insult to um, um, Prophet Muhammad or Quran, others, but um, it, it has um, very um, um, central political significance. And I think that's why, that's what explains why after several um, um, judicial reviews in the constitutional court, um, the judges, um, they never um, accepted the um, petitions, not because the law is, has been that um, good, um, but um, because of the pressure of the public opinion, especially from the Islamists, um, who wanted to uh, maintain um, this law. Um, and I think in this case, um, um, we can see similar phenomenon in other uh, Muslim countries um, as well. In, in fact, that's a question in, uh, coming from, if you let me, because there's a list of questions, I will just summarize. One is okay. uh, uh, a master's student in Indonesia, Aldi, he is asking uh, about the the comparison between Pakistan and Indonesia and then about the future, whether Indonesia will see deepening problem. And another student here at San Diego State, Barak, is asking the role of uh, this blasphemy law toward Ahmadis, because you explain very well how politicized, we see in the documentary how politics play a role. But when it comes to minorities, Ahmadi and other minorities, it's also religious, and then the, the quest, the, since there are many questions, let me combine the two and ask you whether you see a, a, a future more risk, a deepening problem as some Muslim countries are facing now on this issue of blasphemy. Second, 
How is it related to the treatment of minorities, especially Ahmadis? Yeah, okay. So um, if you compare between um, Indonesian and Pakistani um, blasphemy laws, um, <clears throat> um, Indonesian law is actually much um, softer. It's very mild, actually. Um, <clears throat> there is um, a research um, showing that um, actually more than 40% of countries in all the world um, until now, they still have um, blasphemy laws, including in Europe, um, but they differ um, in terms of um, how strong um, they are. And um, Pakistan is among the strongest in the world <clears throat> and very much um, active law. Um, in Indonesia, Indonesia um, falls in the middle. So it's not that, that um, um, strong, <clears throat> um, but still it's there. So um, I think... Um, um, Indonesian blasphemy law is not comparable to the Pakistani law, um, but you can see the same pattern of how the, the blasphemy law um, um, is being used. Um, exactly the same pattern, but, but um, um, less um, in use in Indonesia. So the questions of the Ahmadis. Um, it is also interesting <clears throat> that um, the Ahmadis have been in Indonesia since the beginning of the 20th century, even before the independence of Indonesia. Um, they played prominent roles um, um, in the um, national movement for independence. Um, actually, <clears throat> um, the, um, among the first um, translation of Quran to Bahasa Indonesia, <clears throat> it was also written by an Ahmadi. Um, not many people um, knew that. Um, <clears throat> and um, there were debates, um, I mean, um, really um, fierce um, debates um, between the Ahmadis and the other uh, Muslims um, in the past. Um, but blasphemy law had never been used um, against them. So blasphemy law was used against the Ahmadis um, only beginning in around year 20 or 20, um, uh, uh, 2000 or 2005. Um, so <clears throat> Um, it was there um, for a long time. Uh, the blasphemy law was there. The Ahmadis were there, um, but it was not used against them, but only um, later. The same with the um, Shia um, minority, for example. Um, <clears throat> there has always been debates and others, um, but, but they were never accused of um, using the blasphemy law. Only starting 2012, so it's very um, recent, um, that the law was used against um, a Shi'i. Um, in um, East Java. Um, so again, this, this shows how, um, <clears throat> I mean, the existence of the law itself, um, that doesn't explain um, um, everything, um, but how, how you use it. And um, as I said, um, it has become a very convenient, effective political tools um, to marginalize um, certain um, um, communities. Um, in the case of the Ahmadis and the, the Shia, uh, their population is actually not very high in Indonesia, um, <clears throat> but um, um, it is also um, a way for the um, mainstream Muslim organization, especially um, the General Council of Ulama, <clears throat> not the Muhammadiyah, not the Nahdlatul Ulama, these two largest organizations which you saw in the um, film, um, as far as I know, they never used um, the law um, to accuse um, others of blasphemy. But it's the General Council of Ulama who, interestingly, was um, initially actually was established by the authoritarian government of Suharto. Um, <clears throat> and then later, um, after democratizations, they became more independent and they wanted to assert um, their authority against um, other organizations. Um, it is they who use the blasphemy law. Um, I think um, in the case of Ahmadis and Shia and the Shi'is, um, <clears throat> um, it is used to, to bolster um, their, their standing um, <clears throat> in religious issues, in um, political issues. Now, what about the future? <clears throat> As I said, um, um, blasphemy law is, is an indication of a larger um, um, problem. Uh, including political problem, um, the fundamental issue about the relation between religion and state. <clears throat> and it's really not, not um, um, easy to change that. Um, we have had, um, we have brought to um, um, the law to the constitutional courts. Um, and actually I was um, in one of the reviews, um, 
I became one of the experts um, 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 for this. Um, and um, um, it always failed. Um, so I think um, um, politically, we probably still need to wait, um, I don't know until when, um, to, to change or even revoke the law. Um, but legally speaking, <clears throat> Um, what may be done is actually um, how to um, um, make sure that the law um, is not used um, more frequently. As I said, um, there are um, almost 50% of the countries in the world, they still have blasphemy laws, but many of them, they simply don't use it. Um, so um, I think one way for um, advocacy um, 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 related to this blasphemy law is how to uh, well, this is a pragmatic um, move, um, how to raise the threshold of, of um, what is considered um, blasphemy, um, how do you um, determine religious authority, which may be set this issue, and for the um, police, the attorney, the judges, um, <clears throat> um, one of the advocacies that um, many of the civil society organizations are um, recommending now is um, to not um, as um, um, not using the law um, as much as possible. So if there's um, um, certain issue disturbance in a in a place or dispute, then probably if you want to prosecute that law, you use a different law or um, don't bring it to the court. Um, settle it in in a in a non litigation uh, uh, in in a non litigation ways. Thank you. So let me read another question by Professor Ranin Kazemi of our history department. It's just beautiful to see how Indonesia was able to moderate extremist voices and develop an inclusive path forward in its approach to public place of religion and its role in government. I wonder if uh, Professor Bagir can such give us advice how to bring the story of Indonesia into our classrooms, which are often about the Middle East and Islam, and with focus on Arabic, Turkish, Persian experiences. How can we use the story of Indo Indonesia pedagogically? Yeah, well, <clears throat> um, probably I should promote um, our films. <laughs> um, we have had um, six films and um, precisely um, one of the motivations of producing the films is um, so that um, um, you may bring it to the classrooms. And I think, well, again, thank you, um, Professor Kuru, for, for um, bringing people's attention to this film. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, um, um, what we want to show um, in, the, um, in the series of six films it's actually not, not an ideal model of Muslim democracy or whatever. Um, <clears throat> but um, the, um, um, a different story um, about um, Muslim struggles um, in democratizations, um, in dealing with contemporary issues, including in dealing with the, the pandemic. Um, that's our um, fifth um, film um, to, to show <clears throat> Um, yeah, different um, faces of Indonesia. I don't want to say that Indonesia is exceptional. I mean, it's not, it's not, um, it's not unique. Um, many of our, our um, experience are also taking place in different parts of the Muslim world. Um, but yeah, I agree. Um, Indonesia is um, less known um, in, in, including um, in classrooms, in university classrooms. So yeah, um, um, I, I would recommend the films. I think we we try carefully not to paint um, a rosy picture of um, um, Muslim democracy, um, if there's anything um, which can be called by that name. Um, but um, that Islam is not one. Uh, even within Indonesia, you have seen in the film that there are so many um, different Muslim groups. And I think in democracy, all of them, they have to have a place. Um, some of them are annoying, probably, um, but um, that's what makes um, democracy, um, the participation of the people and, and others. Thank you. I'm receiving many notes, uh, congratulating and thanking, thanking for the film, uh, but we have five minutes to close down. 
uh, I want to finish with uh, a very complex question. Uh, a San Diego State master student, Abdul Rahim Al Isavi, asking, "What makes Indonesia successful in terms of democracy? Is the ulama state alliance that hinders democratization in the Middle East is weaker, and the weak ulama state alliance can be the explanation." Do you, do you agree or disagree? What do you think about the role of ulama in the state and how it makes democracy possible in Indonesia? Yeah, okay. So who is ulama? <laughs> um, who may be called ulama? You see the films, um, many ulama, and they differ one from the other. So I mentioned earlier uh, the general council of ulama, which uses um, that term ulama. <clears throat> which tends to be um, conservative, although I have to say they are, they are in a sense actually moderate. I mean, on issues um, related to terrorism, for example, they are very strong. They have a very strong um, stand against terrorism. Um, <clears throat> but, um, well, in, in Indonesian, in today's Indonesian situations, um, they also want to um, carve um, their um, place in this um, political um, dynamics. Um, so <clears throat> they are conservative, moderate. Um, well, they, they are not always helpful for democracy, for sure. Um, <clears throat> but it's there and, and well, that's the fact. Um, on the other hand, you have Nahdatul Ulama, um, which also carries the name of Ulama, <clears throat> which is quite um, 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 moderate. Um, but even Nahdlatul Ulama is not only one face. Um, Bob um, mentioned, I mean, praised um, Nahdlatul um, Ulama as an, import, in, in, um, an important force in civil Islam, and I agreed with him. But we also need to remember Nahdlatul Ulama is also not one. Um, I mean, the community which um, persecutes um, the um, Shia minority in East Java, um, an example I mentioned before, I think we can safely say most of them belong to the Nahdlatul Ulama. <clears throat> um, so they are the elites of the Nahdlatul Ulama and then the people, um, the grassroots. And then you have um, a pro progressive young Nahdlatul Ulama um, 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 communities, groups. Uh, you have ones which are more conservative. Um, one among the liberal um, Muslim, the, the progressive Muslims, um, um, in the circle of Nahdlatul Ulama is, um, I, I, I would mention um, a group um, which is um, um, an environmentalist group, um, which is very um, strong leftist, I would say, using Marxian analysis. Um, so this is also part of the Nahdlatul Ulama. So th there is that variety. So when um, the question about um, state Ulama alliance, I think it doesn't have um, one um, answer. And um, um, state ulama alliance, um, like in Indonesia, um, sometimes um, you cannot avoid that. Um, it is not always bad news, um, but um, yeah, you have, you have to see the, the um, multiple um, faces of, of ulama as well as ulama state alliance. If you allow me, when we look at Turkey, there is the Dianet that controls 80,000 mosques, Friday prayers. And in Egypt, the state tried to centralize by LSR, Mufti, and control the mosques. But we, we don't see it in Indonesia as a central planning, central Friday sermon, right? The structure is mm -hmm. different. Yes. Would you agree with that? Yes, that's, that's um, correct. Um, th there's not much um, control um, in that sense. Uh, um, in a way, this is good, but also sometimes it's bad news because then everyone, they can claim to be ulama and then preach in the mosque, um, et cetera. And don't forget, um, our vice president now was a former um, head of the General Council of the Indonesian Council of Ulama. So it's really in the center of the state. Um, so, so yeah, ma many interesting things to, to look yeah. at actually. So uh, perhaps that's why you choose the title Unfinished Indonesia. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Many thanks, Professor Zainal Abidin Bagir. If Bob is with us, he can open his camera. If he left, we already thank him. So both of you gave us very thought provoking. Oh, Bob, thanks for staying with us. We are all grateful yeah. for the film, for the art 
and intellectual contribution you have made. And I encourage the audience to watch all six. I truly benefit from all six of them. And I show them the edited volume that they can read. And let's keep in touch. The word is unfinished project. And we really appreciate your contribution to make us to make it better. And I hope to see you in person, either in Indonesia or in Boston in San Diego. Sure. And we will put the conversation part on the YouTube that the audience can be, will be able to see because there were about 350 people registered. Many of them could not mm. join because of time differences, but I will email them the YouTube video so they will join us. So thank you. And uh, I, I'm really grateful. And thank you for the audience staying for such a long time for such a deep intellectual program. We hope to see you in our China event, March 8th. So thanks and have a good one to everyone. Okay, thank Bob you. Bob and Zainal, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you, Pat Zainal.